is up, everybody? You're listening to the Firm Hit Podcast, and I am your friend, Adam Russell, and I am here in my office with the red carpet and my new best friend in the whole wide world, Tyler. What's up, dude? What's going on? Best friends for about three hours now. Man, totally. Yeah. That's how it happens. It's been my favorite three hours ever. At least today. At least my, today. My for favorite sure. three hours today. <laughs> That's right. Mm. Tyler, thanks for making the drive down from Cincinnati. Dude, anytime. Thanks for having me down. All right, so let's just do this. We don't have to go all the way back right now, but let's just go, where are you at right now in your life? Who are you and what do you do? Let's yeah. just do the surface and then we'll go way back. We'll go in the way back machine. So where am I at right now? I'm yes. in Cincinnati, Ohio. Yes. Uh, I'm the worship director at Vineyard Cincinnati. Yes. Uh, in Springdale, Ohio. Yes. Contrary to popular belief, we're not in downtown Cincinnati, but we're close. I don't think I've ever even heard of the neighborhood Springdale. I or, don't, I mean, it's is like... Is it a muci- municipality? I, yes, question mark. I is, think. There an, is there an old town there? Yeah, so it's like you have, you have Springdale and Glendale, and they are two small city municipalities close by. Yes. And that's where we're at. Our address says Spring Springdale. So nice. Okay. Yeah. And that's north of the city? North of the city. So we're about twenty minutes north. And how far city. away from Kings Island are you? That's a great question. We are about twenty five minutes, twenty minutes from Kings Island as well. Kings Island is directly east of us. That is all you need in the world. I mean if, if you're thirteen years old, all you need is where is Kings Island? Where is Kings Island? Okay, uh, next question. Say, what do you want? What do you want to say about the Bengals Ugh. right now? Right now, well, we got to do football talk. As here. of today, as of today, we lost our offensive coordinator. I don't, I don't know if you saw that. Callahan is going. He's now the head coach of the Tennessee Titans. This is, and let me just say this: this is way inside football. This is way inside football. Yeah. See, this is bad for me. Yeah. No, I'm in Kentucky. Yep. We don't have an NFL team. Yep. So Kentucky sports are kind of a big deal to us. So the thing that I was afraid was going to happen is going to happen. Which is? Your OC is going to Tennessee. Oh, okay, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's close friends with the University of Kentucky's offensive coordinator, Liam Cohen. I see where this is going. Now I'm afraid that Liam Cohen will go to the Titans. If Liam Cohen goes to the Titans, I'm very afraid. Are you going to become a Titans fan? Uh, I'm I'm I don't know that I'm a Titans fan. I'm a, I'm I'm Titans curious. Got it. Because Kentucky's previous quarterback, Will Levis, is oh there. yeah, that's right. He's a Titan. That's He's right. a Titan, and he did well. He had a good. He season. did well, and he I love I love that Will Levis will run you over. He will. He's not afraid. He is not afraid. No, I think I think this is detrimental to his career. Yeah, <laughs> but um, I think he like enjoys it. To some no, degree. he for sure enjoys yeah. it. Like he, there's there was a moment, and this was like maybe two weeks before the season was over, where he takes off on a run, and this safety comes down to check him, and he gets wrecked. Yeah, like Levis puts his shoulder in his face mask, and this poor man's head snaps back about <laughs> as violently. And I was, I came off the couch, and I have, you know. Ultimately, I don't care about the Titans. You're Titans curious. You're not. I'm you're not curious. in. I'm yeah. not in. Yeah. But I was. I was like, that's my man. That's my dog. Will Levis. I putting love a that. shoulder on your face I love mask. That. I love that. Will Levis is a dog. Okay. But. So, but what do you want to say about the Titans? So, coordinator is so, now. The coordinator's out, which I think will be fine. Yes. I was. I was more concerned about losing our defensive coordinator, Lou mm-hmm. Anarumo. I thought he was going to be gone. All I have to say is. At this moment, right now, I really don't want the Chiefs to win the Super Bowl, because. I want Burrow to have another shot at beating Mahomes in like the AFC championship and to kind of like regain that status. Right. I feel like that was that was just you can ask my wife. We watched the game so in the AFC championship, not obviously the one upcoming, but last year where we lost. And when Butker kicked the field goal to win. I just laid on the couch for an hour and a half after the game. And Destroy. she was like, are you ready to go? Like, can we go to bed now? I was like, I can't move. Like, yeah, I babe, just, you go You go to bed without just go, me. I will be there at some point. Yeah, and I, I don't know. I just stared at the ceiling for about an hour and a half. I feel that. It's been a long road for a ba- – I'm, I'm a Cincinnati native. Yeah. So it's been a long road for the Bengals fans. And so for us to actually have something to put like – Stock in. And the Reds are terrible. Well, dude, the Reds are going to be special next year, I think. Well, they're young. They're super young. Uh, my uh, son and I went and watched 
Ellie De La Cruz. I mean, he's a phenom. We sat two rows off third base. That's awesome. We got smoked in the sun. I mean, it was just oh, so hot. Yeah. But, okay, so, man, this is becoming a sports it podcast. Is, it I is. I love we're this here. already. We're okay, here. we're in. But I just want to say, Ellie hit, and I'm not even really a baseball guy. Yeah, yeah. But Ellie hit a line drive between the shortstop and third base to the outfield. Yeah. And I promise you, from my seat, you could hear this whirl come off of it. I mean, I, the hair is on the back of my arm. Just whizzing by. I mean, it was this, it wasn't a whistle, it was a whirl. Wow. And I have never in my life, and before you even look up, the man is standing on second. I, I, I turn my head to watch the ball. He's on second. He's unbelievable. I just, I can't, you can't even, it's hard to describe how I love it. athletic and so... I guess what I would say is it's a good time to be a Cincinnati sports fan. Things so, are happening. If anybody wants to jump on board, I don't, I don't push bandwagons off. You, you come on in. Come on room. in. The water's fine. There's plenty of room. That's it. Yep. Um, and I, I just want to say about the Bengals, it feels like the Bengals go as Joe Burrow goes. Yeah. We just got to get him back, right? He is He is the, the backbone. And he's also like steady Eddie. Like if you look at just – I've really – not to over overdo it, but I really appreciate like he is just he is just cool and well, it's Joe cool Joe cool. I mean, it's just like he's never rattled. You never worry that he's not mentally there, and I think that's really impressive. Amen, amen. Okay, well, we did sports talk for our male audience. Yeah, there. It is. I don't know. There's probably some. There's probably some ladies who were into that. Who I have love no the idea. Bengals. Who love Joe Burrow, maybe? They love Joe Burrow, for <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah. Oh, my god. Anything gosh. to not talk about Taylor Swift and football. We can just get away from Dude, that. We, we avoided it yep. somehow. Yep. All right, Tyler, let's do this. This is what we always do on the on the ferment. We we love to know people's stories, cool. and uh, we'd like to know maybe like your origin story. Where did you come from? Mm-hmm. Did you grow up in a household of faith? Uh, you're a worship leader. Was there somebody in your house who played music? Where did that come from? So just start anywhere you want, and I'll jump in. Cool. Yeah. Well, if you aren't, if you don't know by now, I'm a Cincinnati native. Yeah. Hence my Bengals and Reds talk. I was born and raised in Cincinnati, Ohio, mm. and my journey kind of just started. I just had two really faithful parents who, like, the older I get, the more I start to, as I like look back on on my life, I just see like, no, I just had my parents were just two faithful people that love the Lord and like faithfully did what it is he calls us to do, which is just to love people really well and, and to love him. And so I think that's like the best way to describe growing up was just like, I just, I grew up in a home that, you know, had, had really strong values related to what it looked like following Jesus. And that would just became part of who I was. It was like more caught than it was taught. Like I just watched right. my parents do that. And, so and you were church people, and we were church people, yeah. yeah. So we we kind of were for the earlier part of my life. We went to a handful of different churches, and then I remember, and this is kind of like a really significant part of my story. In two thousand one, we landed at Vineyard Cincinnati in Springdale, and uh, the church you currently lead worship at, the church I currently we lead worship at, which is uh, just wild. I love that. Yeah, just full circle. It's really how, cool. how old were you in two thousand one? I was in first grade, so. Whoa. Is that six, seven, whatever you are yeah, in first grade, something like that? Yeah, you're. Yeah, you're like six or seven. Six or seven. So we yeah. were. We landed there because my dad knew somebody that was going there, and and so we just showed up on a Sunday. So all your formative years are there. All my formative years were at Vineyard Cincinnati. Yeah. So, and I remember. So you know, for the most part, that was just what I grew up knowing was was Vineyard and. I was a baseball player throughout high school and baseball was like, that was my thing. Like I was, I, you what know, position? I, I was a pitcher. Oh, lefty or righty? I'm a righty. All right. I, so I might still be playing ball if I was a lefty, but I'm a righty. So no, but I. Just not enough of curveball action. No, nope, just not enough. just been a lefty. It's just a different angle, but yeah. not any happening. Yep. But so I played baseball. That was like what I wanted to do. I was like a baseball guy. And okay. I'm, so and when you grew, let's go back to sports talk yeah. for a second. Who, who, like, did you? Derek did, Jeter was my guy. Derek Jeter was your guy. Yeah, I was number two because I thought he was—he was the captain. He was the coolest. Yeah. So I loved—I loved Jeter and I loved Ken Griffey. How can you not? How can you not? Especially because that was of like the Reds. I mean, yeah. 
Yeah. That was he right was when I was growing bombs. up, too. Oh, he just... He and was, the prettiest swing. Ever. 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 It's so fluid and so smooth. Yes. It's just awesome. He... So I went to the same... So the high school that I went to in Cincinnati, Moeller High School, Griffey and Larkin both went to school there. Barry Larkin. Barry Larkin. So it's just Red's, like, Deep. absolute stars. And so... Deep. Like... It just you heard stories from coaches and all that stuff. So I so you played on the team. I always loved, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it was like loved those like guys you're in the rotation. Of that. Yes. And were any of the coaches who coached you were they coaches who coached those guys? No, no. Okay, yeah, I was I, yeah. that would have been just too good. Yeah, I know. You know, I know. when I was here at yes. Barry Larkin. Yes. Uh, yes. You know, it was. Tell us again, coach. Tell us again, coach. Yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, but their their ghost haunts the halls. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, they're they're blacks up of them and all. This that's stuff. right. Yeah. So so I but but even well before high school, it was just like these were just guys that were stars of the Reds, and then Griffey. I you know it was I was. He was like right at the point where I was. We, my dad would take me to games, and we'd see Griffey play, and and so. So where did music come from? Well, it's great, great. Yeah, because you're just like, you're just out there jocking it up. I know. I loved it when I was in eighth grade, seventh seventh eighth grade, something like that. My dad for Christmas got me and my brother a um, like the Squire box guitar. So it comes with a Squire Strat. An amp, a stand, and a picks or something because yeah, you know it had to. What color? It was b- the black, black with white pick guard. Yeah, perfect. Yep, perfect. Piano black. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And I always tell the story because my dad also got a guitar that Christmas because he wanted to learn how to play guitar, and so we always joke now that he bought us a guitar so that he could buy himself the guitar that he wanted. Okay, so I love that you just said this. Because I have the work, I have a working theory. Okay, and it's about gift giving. Yeah. Whenever anyone gives someone else a gift, yeah, they're really giving you what they want. What they want. <laughs> and good. I know that sounds mean. Not even mean. It just sounds like skeptical or like cynical. Cynical. There's, there's cynical. a little yeah. cynicism in it. Yeah. And I literally don't mean it that way. Yeah. What I mean is that when you receive a gift from someone. You're receiving the thing, yep. but you're receiving insight into who that person is. 100%. Because we're all, we're all trying to get everybody on our team, aren't we? Oh, absolutely. And your dad was on team guitar. He was on team guitar. Yes. And he knew that the only way he could get my mom on team guitar <laughs> was Babe, we'll get the boys a guitar. <laughs> See, you get yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I love it. I yes. love it. I understand this. Yes. So yeah. 100%, that was the... The like theory, yes. and it worked because clearly. Because, and what about your brother? Does he play music? So my brother is more musically talented than anyone else in the family. What does he do? He doesn't do anything related to music. He's a psychologist. Brother, he's a marriage and uh, he's a marriage and family counselor. And and we, what's home base for him musically? He so started on guitar. Yeah, got bored with it because he was so good at it. Yeah, then moved to drums. Got so good at that that he was like, I want to try something else. And then just played, like he took lessons for those two things. And then like randomly a couple years later, he's like, maybe I'll try bass. And buys a bass and plays in all these garage bands in college. And then just. He's just a muso. He is. He, he What's I your remember. brother's name? My brother, Ian. Ian. Shout out to Ian. Shout out to Ian. I remember he was like, he, I was texting him and he was like, yeah, I'm playing in this like event band coming up. And I was like, well, what songs do you have to learn? And he sends me a playlist. And they're like hard songs. Like they're not easy songs. And he, someone sends me a video of it and he's just like ripping. And he's Tearing been playing bass for like five weeks. <laughs> like It makes you sick, doesn't it? It does. Because some people- As liter- someone who practices Yeah, some people be better, have it. Some yeah. people just have it. He, I get he, it. Whatever I have comes by blood and claw. For sure. And yeah. he's just like, yeah, I heard that and I learned how to do it. <laughs> So anyway, so okay. So you get the squire. So you get the squire for Christmas, and we started taking guitar lessons at a local music store right across from Vineyard Cincinnati called Sam Ash. And dude, yeah, yes, it's very. It's uh for anybody it's that like doesn't know, box. it's like a big box. Yeah, it's yeah. similar to Guitar Guitar Center. Yeah, but so we started taking uh, guitar lessons at Sam Ash, and this was a very like it's one of the one of the most memorable like. I don't know what to call it other than like, I just, it was like a formative 
moment where I really think God was was positioning me to go a certain direction in my life because I remember I took my first guitar lesson and I learned how to read tablature, which is a way of I mean it's it is the it's a teenage black hole. It is a teenage black hole. Ultimateguitar.com for anybody who played guitar. <laughs> yes. But basically I could go on there and search any song yeah. and learn how to play it. Yeah. And I went home and I learned tabs for like five hours after that lesson. And I was just absolutely enamored by the guitar. Oh my gosh, when I put my fingers here, it's exactly It sounds the, right. What yeah. Okay. So, what songs were you trying? Oh to Oh man, I was just about to tell you the first song that I ever learned is slightly embarrassing. I love it. All but right. nowadays, now I'm kind of like, yeah, it was sick because they're cool again. This yes. band. But the first song I ever learned was SOS by the Jonas Brothers. You remember that? They're back. You know what's interesting, Tyler? That was the hook. I'm okay. We're just confirming so many of my own <laughs> theories. <laughs> yeah. Your brother Ian is listening to this, and he's like, this guy's a freak. <laughs> it's like, come to my therapy. Come to my therapy, yeah. Yeah, but this is... Uh, one of my other theories is, like, the initial moments of formation are so important. Mm -hmm. So, the initial things that God says to you, especially as a young person, I think are so important for the rest of your life. And God will talk to you the rest of your life, but it probably won't shape you or change you in the way those initial things. Yeah. It's kind of like when God comes to Abraham is like, father of nations. I mean, God says some other things to him, but the main thing he said was... But that was like... It's kind of it. Greatest hits. That's it, right yeah. there. Yeah. And I, it's the same thing in music. I have this theory. Hmm. We have these formational experiences, especially as children or in high school, and, and the things you learn, it's just working on you. Hmm. And... I mean, we'll probably get into this in a little while, but yeah. but like your music now, it's it's pop magic. Yeah, for sure. It completely and totally one hundred percent makes sense that you would be learning Jonas the Brothers taps. Yeah. Absolutely. You you weren't you weren't learning Norwegian black metal. No. no. <laughs> <That's not. laughs> you know? Yes. Yeah. So it just yeah. makes a lot of sense. Yes. And there's a little symmetry there that I that I kinda like. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Love that. Yeah. Okay, right. so you so you learned Jonas Brothers. So I learned Jonas Brothers and then like that really was the turning point for me in the sense of like baseball was the thing that I put all my time and like focus and and thought around. And it was like almost it changed slight like a little bit progressively, but for the most part it it almost changed to music like pretty quickly. And mm. I found myself just like getting lost in like what I thought I loved in baseball was just like times a hundred with music. Mm. And there was something to it that, and there, you know, there was a, na a naivety to it of like, I just didn't know what I didn't know. I just knew every day I could like double my skill by learning this new song and this new song. And then I was like, Oh, this song sounds like this. And so it just became something I just became obsessed with. Love it. Okay. Yeah. When did you figure out you could sing? So I had done choir in like middle school, high school, and even like I had done some some like musical theater as a as a younger kid. And so I knew that singing was something that like I kind of liked and enjoyed and maybe was good at, but I didn't think it was like cool, cool necessarily until I met a guy who was the he was the student worship director at Vineyard Cincinnati when I was in high school. So Who was he? His name was Dustin Smith. Shout out Dustin. D shout out Dustin. He eventually went and was at the Dayton Vineyard for a little while. But Dustin was this guy who would play acoustic guitar and sing and the music sounded cool. Mm. And I remember like going to the student gatherings on Sunday mornings and being like, okay, that's pretty cool. Like yeah. he's playing music and singing and it, it like sounds cool. Yeah. It's working on you. It was working on me. And so eventually I got plugged in with the student band and started leading worship with Dustin on a weekend. And, you know, it was funny because I like, I still at that point was like a guitar player. I would like would sing, but it wasn't like, I wasn't like dying for the opportunity to sing. And then I got to sing a little bit and that was really fun. And then this, this moment was like the, 
a really another really significant thing for me, which was, and not like a oh I'm glad it happened, but it was totally a thing where God was like shaping, again kind of pushing me along this path of probably either my junior or senior year. I'm, I can't remember fully, but it, Dustin had to have a vocal procedure, and so he was a staff guy and was leading every weekend with the students, and I would jump in with them maybe once a month and play guitar and lead. And so he comes and basically says, I have to have a vocal procedure. I can't sing for eight weeks. Can't even talk for eight weeks. And he says, can you lead the next eight weeks? And I'll play guitar with you. Yeah, to me. And he says, I'll play guitar with you. And we had some other like vocalists that could could be part of it. But essentially he was kind of like- He's leaning on you. I need like, I can't do this for eight weeks. And I remember being so nervous. <laughs> yeah. I was like, whoa. Do everything for eight weeks? Yeah, like, man. And and so I said yes, of course, because I was like, I was like thrilled, but also like terrified at the same time. Yeah. And, and you looked up to him. And I totally looked up. Like, I, like wanted, I, I wanted you, to do what I he did. I will run through this wall for you, Dustin. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And that was a lot of my confidence in like, you know, the little bit of skill I had as a musician was totally reinforced in that eight weeks because it it took me to a place of like, I saw rhythm of doing something over and over again and and how important like the, like doing it often and, and preparing for it. And dude, some of worship leading is just reps. A hundred percent. You just need, you just got to do it. A hundred percent. And yeah. I, and I just got those reps at 17 and yeah. it was awesome because I had a lot of freedom to just do Were you a it junior? wrong. Junior in high school. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. So I, I just had a lot of freedom to do it wrong. And did that start changing the way that your brain was thinking about the future? I think. And I'm talking about like career, vocation. Yeah. I think to some degree I didn't, because the only example of a job in music and not even like a, a worship like a role on a, like a, at a church in, in worship. I think I didn't even have a context for what like that could look like. I, it didn't completely like say, Oh, you could go do this, but it definitely like made me think, okay, I want to do this for a long time. Mm. Like I could see myself investing in this for a lot of my life. Okay. So when did the worship leader switches? And I'm talking about vocationally mm-hmm. and future orientation. Where, where did where did they get punched? Probably sometime after college. And I went to I went to a a, a small Christian university in in Chattanooga, Tennessee, Cleveland, Tennessee, but just just north of of Chattanooga, Cleveland, Tennessee, Lee University. And yeah, I think a lot of people who listen to this would be very probably fa- familiar. Yeah, they'd yeah. be very familiar. Yeah. Lee is like a music school, mm-hmm. but, but I didn't go for music. I have a, a finance degree. I mean, like. <laughs> You're a finance bro. I'm a finance bro. I was a, even better. I was a business guy who just liked to play guitar. Okay, so wh- did you? What did you do when you were at Lee besides study? I mean, did you lead worship? I I led worship for a few churches around the Cleveland area, and yeah. then like any of the event bands on campus, not any, but some of the like student led events, they would have bands. And because Lee's a music school, like there are just some insane musicians that right. are at Lee. And I was not one of those insane musicians. I was just the guy that could sing. Yeah. And so I would get to be part of some of these bands and like play covers at these events and stuff. And it was super fun. Mm. And so that but even then that wasn't necessarily like worship. That was like pop, secular, yeah. honestly country. Because we were in Tennessee, yeah, of course. You're, gonna, you're just you're just out there playing the. This hits. was back when Hunter Hayes was like killing, <laughs> and I mean, we would play some Hunter Hayes. <laughs> we would play. Uh, I forget his name. I, I'm blanking on the guy's name, but one of the guys from Rascal Flats went to Lee University, so we would play tons of Rascal Flats. Gotta, I gotta. Home team represent. Yeah, it was awesome. Okay, but so I think worship, like worship as a vocation, started after college, where I it came to that point in my life where like most people, I would say, I think most people find themselves in this place where if you go to college, even if you have a path of like, I know exactly what I want to do. There is this like, I don't know if limbo is the right word, but it's this like unsure time of like, what do I do next? What, 
what does my life look like at this point? And so right. I was in that space for, you know, six to eight months right yeah. after college. And I was working a job that was just very much a paycheck. And This is after college? This is after college. Are yeah. you still so living I'm, in Tennessee? No. So, I'm, I, so I moved back to Cincinnati yeah. and I was living in my parents' house, for, you know, six to eight months. Yeah. And I was leading worship at a church that I knew the lead pastor really well. And, and he had invited me to just, you know, hang around them and and lead worship and just while I figured it out. And I got a call from a guy named Ben Hardman, who was, he had just taken a job as a lead pastor in the Atlanta area. So Marietta, Georgia. And he called and and basically said, hey, these two people that you know, I asked them both individually for a worship leader that I should hire. And they both separately gave me your name. There we go. And he, Interesting. and he basically said, so can I invite you down to Atlanta? Come check out the church that I'm going to be leading and see if this is something that God's doing. How, how did it feel when he told you that two people independently said that I should hire you? It was one of those things where the two people that he said were two people that discipled me at like Vineyard as a student. They were two people that like walked with me as I tried to be someone that followed Jesus, right? So it was like, I mean, not to be, not to poke fun at it, but it was like, God, like, are you saying something right yeah. now? Like, are you directing yeah. me in a certain way? And because right. I'd never met this guy, literally never met this guy. Yeah, it's interesting. Sometimes, yeah, and I underline the word sometimes, but sometimes. You know, and I think it's pretty normal for young people too. But sometimes we don't even know. We j- we we have less of an idea of what God is doing in our lives, but some other people around us have some things. They they see it for sure. They see what we carry. Yes. You know, I, I don't know. It's that sometimes even in myself, I can get around people, and it's obvious. I'm starting to see like some of what is going on in their life. Maybe just calling if you want to use that word or vocation or the activity of God yeah. or, or just their talents. Yeah. Skill set of any skill set yeah. or whatever, you know, you know, sometimes I can see it and I'll start to talk about them and start to talk with them about it and realize, Oh, I have more faith for you right now than you do. For sure. You know, it's like, yeah. Oh, I can see this in you and you just, for whatever reason you can't, you know, yeah. and it's not even, and I think that's true of everyone. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And And for me in that moment, it was more of like, I just didn't even, I just, I don't even think I thought that was possible. Like that I could do a job that was like, that was my every single day, like leading worship and and discipling like more worship leaders and like dreaming about the gathering itself and leading people in spirit and truth. I just, I didn't have any context that you could do that. Like I knew people did, but I think there's something about like if you, have like insight into that you can totally be like yeah that's a job i just for whatever reason i just that was something my brain couldn't wrap its head around and that's amazing by the way i mean i'm so glad you told this story because i think there there are people probably listening to this podcast right now and that's going to flip some switches for them it's cool yeah you know i mean it, it for me was a it was a totally that was probably for me the first like risk i remember taking like on what I thought God was saying to me because it you just moved to, you moved to Atlanta. Dude, I thought I thought when I moved to college I was like, "Whoa, this is serious." It was not. It was absolutely not. I would go And home. Atlanta's a big city. Atlanta's a huge city. I mean, it's bigger than Cincinnati. It's a big city. 4 4. Point something million people. Oh, it's just it's and it's, it's like bigger the, than that now. I it's mean, like it's like the just, fifth biggest city in the world or in the country. Yeah, I mean, right. It's ridiculous. Huge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so you feel that. I felt especially it. Especially as a young guy. I was like, renting Whoa. my first apartment. Yeah, you paid that deposit. Oh. And I didn't have any money as it was, so no, just you watching have no money. more money go out just, the yeah. yeah. And then you're like, "Wait, I have to pay to get my electric turned on oh and dude listen to this oh this was tragic so i just i had just gotten a new car yeah and i was so hyped about it i'd saved up a ton of money <laughs> and i bought a it, i bought a 2015 jeep cherokee yes. and so it's not the grand it's like the the dumbed down model of the grand the smaller the one. smaller one yeah 
And I love this car. I still have it. Yeah. It's not doing as great as it was, but <laughs> it's not, it's just, you it's, saw I'm not driving it today. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, you know, you're in a different one. I'm in a different one. But so I, I just bought this car and I bought it in Ohio. And yeah. so about a month later, I moved to Atlanta and I still had like the temp tags. And so right when I got there, I had to get Atlanta plates. Well, I didn't know that when you move, that Atlanta has a rule where if you buy a car out of state, you have to pay, and maybe this is other states. It's just I know that Georgia is this way. I didn't know that when you move to Georgia, if you buy a car from outside of Georgia, you have to pay what's called an ad valorem tax. So maybe this is other places as well. Yeah, it's it's kind of a thing sometimes. Man, I had to pay twenty percent of the value Whoa! of my car. Oh, yeah, and I had no thank you, and had no idea. Much. And so, like, I had I was like, okay, I got this little bit of like budget margin. <whistles> Bye. Yeah, so the beginning of your worship leading journey is not just trusting God for the vocation, but it's trusting God for everything. Trusting God for everything. I I, I had moved to a new place. Yeah. And didn't know anybody either. That was the thing. I knew I the guy that I was supposed to like, the guy that brought me down there, I'd known for like as long as everybody else had, in that community. So yeah. I, I knew so it's no all one. new. It's all brand new. And then just it was the definition of like okay, God there is something deeper here that I am here to experience and I, I'm, but I'm trusting you in it. Registration is now open for Vineyard Worship Essentials Summer Cohorts, now offered in both English and Spanish. Our Essential Series stands as our flagship training program designed for worship leaders at every stage of development. Whether you're embarking on your journey or seeking to refine your skills, we're thrilled for you to grow deeper into your calling of worship leadership. For more information, visit vineyardworship.com essentials. I love that. Well, and I just want to say this, because I think this I think this story is so important for people. Yeah. Because there's so many young people listening. Yeah. Like this is what your twenties are for. Your twenties are for exploration. Your twenties are for trying things out. Screw up. It's fine. Like do it wrong. Do it wrong. It's fine. Go bankrupt twice. It doesn't matter. I mean, no. I it, you know, you're a finance guy. I mean, whatever. It matters. But it doesn't matter because literally you could really screw things up, and when you turn 30, it'll all be okay. There is a level of, and I think I feel this now, as someone who is literally turning 30 in like three weeks. That's turn, right. And like, there are things that happened in my 20s that I now look back on. I'm like, oh, I wish I could do that different, yeah. but I think of life a lot differently yeah, because of certain things. And yeah. it's just totally like, screw it up. Go get your reps and yeah. figure things out. It's good. Talk to me about leading worship in Atlanta because Atlanta is that's a church town. It's a church town. I mean, we are we are in the Bible Belt. I mean, Atlanta is you got like historic MLK stuff, but then it's just and it's like mega church world, too. mega church world. Yeah. I mean, you got Passion City. Mm-hmm. There's just big churches everywhere down there. People go to church in Atlanta for sure, right? So just yes. talk to me about being a cut your teeth worship leader in church town. Yeah. Yeah. I was in a, so the church that I took a job at was a church of about a hundred people in Marietta, Georgia. And it was part of this greater network of churches, the Grace family of churches. And I love still really dear friends from this community of churches. And, and I, you know, this essentially was like me learning how to be a worship pastor and doing it wrong and figuring out like, okay, what does leadership actually look like? I thought I knew like, I guess here's what I say. I had people that were like, Tyler, you're a great leader. But then I like was in leadership moments and I was like, (laughs) I don't know what to do. I don't think I'm a good leader. I don't don't even know what to do. I don't know how to have this conversation. I mean, just stuff that just felt like, this is me. I have to do this. Like I have to have this conversation. Yeah. Um, Say more about that. Like what, what, talk to me about a moment when you were like, I have to have this conversation. I remember this is mine now. What? Yeah, I mean, I think anything the the there's like really surface level type things where it was just purely confrontation of yeah. I didn't even know how to confront people super well, 
in the sense of like why would you though right why, why would, would you why would i yeah you're in your early 20s okay so just talk to me talk me through your first moment of like mild confrontation i remember it was like my <laughs> third weekend leading who doesn't show up well <laughs> They showed up, I'll tell you. Oh, they show up so it was in a this, particular manner? It, they showed up in this particular manner. It was a person who was a longtime attender of this church. Yes. And loved this family. And yes. I was doing things a little bit different than everybody else in the sense of, you know, I, I was deciding to run rehearsal a little bit different. And I was using some like production things that, no one else really used before. And were you using track? I was using Ableton with, yeah. with just a click. That was all it was. I was just using a click. And so I just asked the person, I said, Hey, on this part right here, I noticed that this happened. We we're just not on time anymore. I yeah. was like, So just be cautious of that when we get it again, but we'll don't worry, we'll run it again. Yeah. Well, I guess that person felt very accused. And so Afterward, they just pulled me aside and decided to tell me exactly what they thought. Oh. And I remember thinking, what do I do? I just took it and I was like, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to 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 harm. I didn't mean to. Yeah, yeah I just, you, were, you were just uh, shook. Like, I didn't even know what to say. Yeah, right. And so in that moment, I like, you know, we, the conversation happened. I totally didn't even push back at all. I yeah, just, you just, you, you were like, whoa. I just felt like I w didn't even know how to respond. And yeah. I went home that night and I was like, is that, is that what leadership is? Is that like, do you just take it? I didn't it? feel like leadership. I didn't feel like, I just felt like I was a punching bag. Yeah. And so it was every, anything from that to then, like my favorite, and this still happens, but I think <laughs> I just am better equipped to like, not let it attack my identity or who I am. But just when people tell you that they think you're wrong in like, yeah. you know, I shared an idea from yeah. a passage of scripture and what I felt like, what I felt like I heard from God. And when people just write you an email the next day to just Tyler, say- that was dumb. And it was incorrect. And here's what's actually correct. Yeah. You big dummy. Don't and, you know this? And let me tell you what, man, I wrote somebody an email. Yeah. You're like, wait a minute. And I let them have it. And I remember looking back now and it's like, no. Yeah. That wasn't it. That was a miss. So that was a miss. I thank you for telling those stories. Yes. Yeah. On the one story, you took too much. Yep. But in the next story, you gave too much. Yep. Right? Yes. Man. Isn't that leadership though? Totally. Like learning. Because there's a there's a razor in there somewhere. There totally is. Yeah. And it's like, okay, I'm not your punching bag. Yep. And yet, maybe there's something in that moment I could have learned better for you. Yep. Mr. Click guy. Yep. You know? Yep. But at the same time, like, hey, we're all on the click. Yes. And I'm going to give you another chance. Yes. And I'm literally not mad. We're doing this together. Like, I'm literally not mad. Yes. Yeah. So there's that. Then the other one is like, okay, theology, bro. You know? Yeah. That's just, I, I, I love those two stories because they really do highlight that tension that's in leadership of meeting people, but, you know, you're not allowed to just attack me and no. i'm not allowed to attack you no like that's not what leadership is it's right. not like who's got the strongest leadership arm for right. wrestling you know right. or whatever and to also not allow those things to really impact what i think of myself in those moments because mm. as somebody who for anybody that's an enneagram person i think it's a helpful tool uh i'm a three on the enneagram so very much i like to achieve and I like to look really impressive. And when I feel like I don't look impressive or when I feel like I- Got it wrong. Got it wrong. It's hard. Least favorite feeling for me. And so in yeah, both of those moments, I felt like I was yeah. either un unimpressive slash got it wrong. And mm. so for me, it was very easy to go fight or flight. And I went flight just and take one. take that into the deepest part of who you are. 100%. Yeah, it wasn't just a thing that happened, but this is like saying something about who I am. Yes, it it, it, they, it came at my character mm. and okay. who I was. Well, then talk to me about that season of your life and who helped you... Navigate that a little yeah, bit. Who, who yeah. helped you? I mean, name them or don't, but mm -hmm. talk to me about like being discipled to be a leader. Talk to me about getting better. Talk to me about... Just working those initial pieces of leadership out in your life. There was a, 
um, or there still is a worship school that goes by the name of uh, 10,000 Fathers and 10,000 Mothers. Or 10,000 Fathers and Mothers, I think is their new name. Yeah. And Aaron Keys. Aaron Keys. Shout out. Yeah, big shout out. Aaron Keys, David Walker. My coach's name was Terry Foster. I mean, these are guys who they essentially, so if, for anybody that's not familiar, I can give like a 30,000 foot perspective, but basically 10,000 Fathers and Mothers is a, a coaching cohort for worship leaders. It's yeah. essentially a worship school. And it's yeah. a, when I went through it, it was an 18 month journey, basically broken up into three, six month cohorts, essentially. And it's all based around character, competency, and then how you disciple people into that, how you essentially multiply as a leader, right? Mm. And so you actually had somebody helping you. I had 18 months of somebody walking with me week in, week out, basically calling me to find my identity and something more than whatever it would have been, myself, the stage, the impressiveness slash getting it right, right? Yeah, I had how someone, good my vocal is, how 100%, well I play, my, how it goes. Uh, how it goes. How it goes. That's how a great way to say it. Yeah. yeah. How's how, it going this week? Yes. Somebody was calling me to find my identity and something more. Yeah. Then they were actually, but then they were taking me of the like, but you should do it well. And doing yeah. it well is good. Like that is honoring to God as well. Challenging you. Yeah, yeah. totally. Totally. Talk to me about that. What what, what was that like? Uh, I think or, or what happened, or you know, uh, an example. I, I love that. I think it helps people. Mm-hmm. I had a, a really great, now still a great friend of mine. His name's David Walker. I mean, he was a guy that would constantly challenge me in, you know, how am I incorporating, like, how am I actually pastoring people while leading worship? Because up until that point, I had, I was like, worship was playing songs, and just do the set. Yeah. And if it, good, good. If, it, if it works, it works. If it doesn't... Make your transitions good. You better land it. Yeah, land it. You better it. be sick, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So what kind of things was he pushing on you mm-hmm. about? Well, I, the biggest thing was like, how do you incorporate scripture into your worship set? So like, how do you actually challenge people to like use Like you, God's the worship word? leader. Like me, the worship leader. Not just some person. Not just the pastor teaching. Right, or right. Or not just the person who is doing announcements and right. is going to do some maybe call to worship. Not the host. Nope. It was you, you the worship leader. Mm. And how he, you know, he challenged me to say like, how do you incorporate scripture into your leading? And how do you, as a worship pastor, pastor people through both song and God's word? Mm. And that to me was something that I, I just never done. Did that and feel new to you? It did. And it felt hard. Okay. It felt hard because... What felt hard? Like the... I'll just leave it there. What felt hard? The hardest thing for me was I was I was young at the time. I mean, I was 24, 25. Yeah. And so I think my insecurity was that I didn't know enough about scripture. Mm, it's the theology fear. It's and like, I, oh, and I'm going to ruin I had people. Well, or, and I'm going to get it wrong because I had people that... I had people from my age to in their 60s at, at my church. And so it was like... Is the kid who's 25 really going to give the 65-year-old like something yeah. that is like new and unheard or even right? Do you have to say something new or unheard? Well, now I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's the thing, right? Like yeah, we, yeah. It's, it's, that, it's that lie in our heads that says we need to be novel. 100%. I need to come up with something new every Sunday. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, it's something really freeing for me a long time ago was the definition of profound is simple and true. Amen. And that to me- Not novel. Not novel. And not brand new. That was inspiring to me. Hey, listen. Okay, that's worth the podcast right there. (laughs) That's worth the podcast. Profound is what? Simple and true. Simple and true. Yeah. All right, worship leaders. Put that on- Pin it. Pin it. (laughs) Pin it. Okay, that's that's actually wonderful. Yeah. And what a freeing thing, right? Oh, so freeing. Because then then I was able to say like- Okay, perfect example, Psalm 150. We've all heard it. Praise God. That's literally every line pra- it starts with praise him or praise God, praise him. And so it was like, what do I have to say about Psalm 150 that's new? Nothing. And, it, and I don't need to. No. Because it's enough. Yeah. But it needs to be there. Yeah. And so that I, was lo- I really do love that definition of profound, simple yeah. and true. Because the truth is, what what is profound for me may or may not be profound for 
every single person in the room, but it will be for someone. Yeah. And even if it's very simple, there's a chance that there's like a brand new believer or someone who is has no experience with Jesus or the Bible or church, and they come in and you say something very simple and very true, and it, it like unlocks the character of God or the ministry of the Spirit or yeah. just the kindness of the scriptures. It, it could be really profound for them. Totally. Yeah. I love that. And there's something cool about that. It's amazing. Well, and, it, and it's back to that word you used a moment ago about pastoring the room. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And I and I think there's some when you have something that's that familiar, it brings everyone together. Mm. Like it 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 takes it removes as much as you can in a place where you know you have some people looking one way and some people looking the other, like a stage. But it does. I think it brings people together, and there's mm. a familiarity to it. Mm. So that was part of your discipleship, not just totally play good, no. sing good, but like how can you pull this room together? By the scriptures. Yes. So that was the frame. That was the big thing that that was challenged to me and something that was like new to mm. me, which mm. was just how do you how do you use God's word not to like fit what you're doing, but to be the actual like the guide. And Does that stay with that. you even now? For sure. Yeah, it's just, just For become, sure. it's become a part now of it's just part of who I am. I can't help but think Okay, where how do how does how do the songs accompany the word of God? It's just okay. So let's just be granular here for a moment. Yeah. Uh, how many songs are you gonna lead on Sunday? Anywhere from like we do like two to three and a half. Yeah, three and a half. We'll call it three and a half. It's usually like I love, three songs in a chorus. Three and a half. I love that. Three and a half. Uh, and I think you told me earlier off mic you, you have like some songs up front and then after the message. It's like a fifteen minute up front. Post message like fifteen minutes. Yeah, ministry time. Ministry time. And a lot of like, try to pay attention to Holy Spirit. Yeah, we're just flowing, but yep. we're but we're also we've got guess, some structure, but we're going to pull it together too. Yep. Yeah. So there's like yes. fifteen and fifteen. Yep. Three and a half songs. Yep. Talk to me about even now. This is a part of your own formation. I want I want to pastor the room. I want to I want to incorporate scripture. I want to I want to be simple and true. Just talk to me about it's Tuesday. It is Tuesday when we're recording yeah. this. It's Tuesday. You're already thinking about next week's set. You have an idea of what's going to be. What's happening in you or in your mind this week as it relates to the scripture and also wanting to be someone who's bringing those moments into worship? I love this idea. I had a someone that was part of the community of churches in in that I worked for in Atlanta. Her name was Kirby. And she would always say, God might tell you what to say for Sunday on a Tuesday, or God might tell you on Monday, here's the word that I want you to share for Sunday. And I, and I remember she would always say that. And it was always cool because she would share like on a Sunday, she was like, hey, I was reading on Tuesday morning and God told me this. Yeah. And here's what I was reading. And I always felt so inspired by that because mm -hmm. it was like, it took out, for me, it took out the um, the pressure of like needing to create something. Spontaneous. It, it, ex uh, it extends the the boundaries of spontaneity. Yes. Yeah, spontaneity yes. is not just in the moment. No. Brilliance in the moment or no. whatever. Yeah. It became a, what is like, what does it look like to live a life with Jesus? You're just listening all week. All week long. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not just listening for that moment on Sunday when we're leading worship. Yes. Yeah. And 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 to some degree I'm listening just purely cuz I'm trying to follow Jesus better. But yeah, you're this a Christian. Is, I'm a, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but then the outcome is sometimes God says something and there's this like I always know for me it's like I always feel like this pressure in my chest. I of, love that. Yeah. For me it's like I get I I kind of like not like anxiety, but it is this thing of like when I'm like hearing something I'm like okay, this is significant. And so I try to write that down or mm. or voice memo it out. Love that. Just what I'm hearing. And then I just try to for me in that like that back half of worship that we're talking about where it's, you know, we've got some structure, but we've also got some space. I try to hold things loosely of like, okay, I remember this was the thing that God said to me this week. And I kind of like fleshed it out a little bit of like, this was the scripture. Maybe this was the truth that he was trying to remind me of. And I just try to have that thing ready. And have it in my back pocket of like, 
this is what I know God might want to say if the moment prompts itself. So I think, I, I guess maybe what I would say is I have that moment every single Sunday, but then I also try to have a moment that's really specifically planned of, I have a scripture that I'm going to read and it's going to be in conjunction with a song of some sort. Like, yeah, so you're just you're you're just finding those themes and connecting them a little bit. Yeah, like this past weekend, we were we sang, we sang the, the like the theme of the day was being with Jesus changes my family. So we were singing the song "I Speak Jesus," which is just yeah. a fantastic song. And I, during the week, I felt like God had po- kept pointing me to Acts 16, which was the story of where Paul and Silas are in prison and. And just to share an idea about that going into the song, I Speak Jesus, where they're singing and worshiping and then the earthquake happens and breaks open the the cell doors. And so I just had like a real prompt toward that. And so I just had like that scripture fleshed out as like, a, like an encouragement of truth. And I just threw it in my back pocket and I knew at some point I was going to say that, but I didn't know when. And so I had that in my back pocket and was ready to use it because I knew I need to have some truth of God's word to be able to present within this singing. Mm, I love that. And then you're just looking for those moments. And trying to just trust the Holy Spirit in it. Yeah, that's great. So it's that it's that interesting dynamic of trusting. There's a little bit of preparation, but I'm listening all week. Yeah. And this is for Sunday. Yeah. So and I don't, I mean, maybe I'm going to ruin it like a little bit, but for me, spon- spontaneity rarely comes as a brand new thought. Rarely comes as a brand new thought. I mean, spontaneity most times is something that God has been doing in me way longer than that moment right then. That's just wisdom. But well, just that just was the prompting to share it in a larger context. Yeah, it's just wisdom. And so, I don't know. Yeah. I know for me as a preacher... Sometimes when I get yeah, that's off, that's a the, cool context. I want to hear that. Well, that it's just, I mean, I mean, anybody who's a preacher knows, you know, that you you have your sermon, and then yeah, and there's more, right? Like yes. it's just in the moment. Like preaching, preaching at its best is this conversation between the text, God, you, the congregation. There's just a lot happening there. Yeah, but I, I also know, you know, my strongest moments as a preacher is in leaning into the moment that we're having together. Yeah. That is coming from a foundation of prayer and studying the text that week and yeah. listening. So there's this there is this spontaneous portion which is real and you feel it, mm-hmm. but but I can also get out there too far. Sure. And I know my moments of greatest regret have been when I leaned a little too far. <laughs> That's awesome. But the only way you figure that out is to lean. Yeah. You just have to go out and sink a couple times. A hundred percent. Been there, done that. It's going to be all right. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Then we do it 52 times a year. You we know? do. <laughs> it's something, it's yeah. going to, you're going to sink a couple times. If you are, if it works out 30, 35. You're great. That's a pretty good success rate. It's great. If you bat 300, you're Hall of Fame. You're Hall of Fame. Back to sports. Come on. Um, Tyler, how did you end up back at Vineyard Cincinnati? It's a great question. Yeah. I... So like I said, I was in Atlanta and I was there for about four, four and a half, five years. So like 2017 to 2021 is, 2021 is when I moved back to Cincinnati. Mm. It's a wild story. The guy that was, so the guy that's the current lead pastor at Vineyard Cincinnati, his name's Matt Massey. Shout out Matt Massey. That's right. He, in 2020, accepted the lead pastor position and essentially called me and said, hey, I, I'm going to be hiring a worship director, would you want the job? How did he know you? So he, remember the church I was saying I was allowed, they were letting me hang out and figure oh, stuff yeah, out. Oh, yeah, yeah, So you had hung out with him before. So that was Matt Massey's church. And mm. he was at a different church at that time. And he basically said, hey, just come hang here. Like, be with us. Figure your life out. Figure your life out. Do something that we know you're good at, which yeah. was lead worship, and we want you here. Yes. And it was people I trusted and and people that like spoke truth in my life. And so I'd known Matt for you know, a lot of years at this point. And so he calls me like mid pandemic 2020. I mean, it's like June. Sad. Awful time. We're all sad. Yeah. Maybe even like, maybe even earlier, but who knows? It was like, I mean, it was like shelter in place (laughs) era, you know, like, (laughs) and 
he calls, he said, Hey, I'm in a, like, I'm moving into this new role. Would you want to be my worship pastor? And there was like a short amount of silence. And I just said, no. And he was like, you're gonna say no already? Like you didn't even think about it. And I was like, dude, I don't, I don't want to come back to Cincinnati. Like I love Cincinnati, but I love the South. Like I loved, I was, I love Georgia. I was dating my, my wife at the time and she was in Chattanooga. We loved the South. Like we just knew this is where we want to be. And he's like, all right, well, just think about it. And I said, all right, whatever. And hung up the phone and he called me like six months later, asked the same question. And I just said, no. And he said, all right, well, at least like, will you just help me fill in some gaps while I hire somebody? And I was like, I would love to do that. Like, I would love yeah, so to come up. So you're just going to come guest worship lead for a few weeks. A couple weeks. And I was like, that sounds like a blast. It's a great excuse to get to like spend time with my parents. Yeah. They're still living in Cincinnati. And so I went up. Uh, so at this point, it's March of 21. And I went up for the first time in March. And I remember he knew exactly what he was doing by inviting me. Because I went up one time and I remember thinking oh man, this would be really cool. Mm. And this would be, this feels like a good fit. And it was almost like a little- What was the surprise? Because you said no twice and you go up and you're like, this feels good. What was this? I would imagine there's surprise or there's- uh... I think the surprise was just how, like my, it's, it's kind of hard to explain other than how like good of a fit it felt. I just remember walking in and feeling uh, like- this feels like a really great fit. And, you know, it was a place that I, I mean, I grew up in this place, but not, I mean, it was a different place from when I was there. I mean, I left in 2013 and yes. it's now 2021. I mean, it's just a, no, lifetime, a lifetime ago. Lifetime. Not, none of the same people. Yeah. I mean, just completely different place. Yeah. And so, but I remember just going up and being like, this is, this just feels right. And so, you know, I went home and, then it was on my mind all the time. And Did you call him back at this point? No, he called me again ah. and basically was like, hey, that was really fun. And I was already scheduled to come back again. So he was like, hey, in like two weeks, let's hop on the phone and like start planning for that. And I was like, great. Well, I came back two more times and each time it just felt more of like, oh man, like is God, God, are you like trying to bring me back here? Like, is this really... You know, and so I me and my wife were engaged. It was, I mean, my fiance at the time. And so we are living in two different places. And now as a not even married couple, we're starting to have the conversation of like, do we take, like, should we accept this role yeah, and we move to our Cincinnati? Life. Yeah. And, and so I remember we just, I mean, it was just a back and forth conversation of like, do we, do we not, do we, do we not? And then, and it, and this whole time I'm going through an interview process, uh, you know, th- start when I came back the second time in April, I was like, all right, I'll, I'll go through the interview because I was like, you guys might not even want me after like right. some interview. Like you just may be like, oh no, that was not what we thought. So get to the end, I get offered the role and, you know, we just... It was just, the t- it was the time we had to make the decision. And and we both just in our heart felt this, this thing of me and my wife, we both felt in this heart of, or in our hearts, like this is where God's calling us, you know, right now. Mm. And. You know, Tyler, as you tell the story, I can't help but notice that when you moved to Atlanta, there's like that risk piece. Yeah. Right? And then to come home, there was a risk piece. Yeah. Like we we never we never lose that, do we? No, no, it never gets easier either. No, you you think oh that'll be an easy call to make, but you know when you, so there's that piece of following God that always feels like I'm taking some kind of risk. Here. It always feels like a risk, and yeah. what sucks even more is usually when it feels like a risk means it's right. Yeah, and that's what's be. even harder. I yeah. mean, sometimes so hard, right? And so huh. I, I just remember us, you know. Okay, I have another question. Yeah. So your Atlanta church was m- much smaller church? Yeah. I by mean, the by the end it was like about a 200 250 person church. Like a a perfect church. Yeah. And then you're coming into Cincinnati, much much bigger church. Yeah. There might be 200 people on staff. I don't know, right? Like it's just a I think there was at one point. Not there anymore. was at one point. Yeah, 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 but, yeah. But it's just a different place. So there's like different culture 
by sh- sheer size. It's just drastically different. And then the things you're responsible for are like very different. Mm-hmm. The way a service goes is way different. Yep. Just a lot more buttons to click, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. And, you know, I, I know your pastor a little bit. Not a lot, but good dude. I mean, I know he's not yeah. pointing guns at anybody's head, but I just know when you're at a church like that, it's just, it is, in some ways, there's more on the line. Yeah. You know? Whereas, whereas when you're at a church of 250 and it's a family church, you know, you're like, we figured it out. Yeah. It's like, fine, whatever. Yeah. So, talk to me about making that shift. Totally. It was, well, so there was like, there was a relief in it at, uh, to some degree because I went from the person who, I was five different people, right? Oh, I, yeah. You were just carrying everything. I was the worship. I was the guy that led worship. I was also the production director. I was also the person that made sure that everything got turned on at six in the morning. I was also the person that planned the service and scheduled everybody. You're I mean, putting in all the songs and pro presenter. All of it. Yeah. Every bit of it. And so I went from that to now my job was lead worship, m- like multiply leaders and. Yeah, right, and, and, right and there's a staff who's helping. Totally. So that felt like relief. It felt like relief. Yeah. The part that was hard was there's so many rules. <laughs> Just say more about that. Well, like I what, think, what, like what, what kind of rules, or or what felt like structure? Like, like what is I it? have to, like I have to get approval. Like you have to plan out. This is people are going to be like, yeah, of course you have to. I'm like, no, I don't think so. Yeah. Like there was like you have to plan out what the announcements are going to be. And you, and I just can't decide, hey, we're looking for drummers. Would you want to, if you want to play, come talk to me afterward. Like, I'm just not allowed to do that. As Yeah, you got to put it in the queue. Yeah. Or if I'm having an event, I can't just be like, yeah, we'll use that room. No, you have to reserve the room and make sure that it's taken care of. Yeah, this is all stuff I just did at my other church. I was like, hey, we're going to, Yeah, I, I can turn the alarm off. And right. I can, you know. Yeah, we're coming in. We're coming in. We'll be here. People are coming at 6 p.m. Yeah. So there was that. And and I honestly, my wife makes fun of me for this because she says, and I say this too, but I I don't like say it out loud, but she says that r- I think rules are good as long as I don't have to follow them. Right, right. That's uh, that's all of us, yeah, right? Yeah, 100%. Rules for you, not yeah, for me. Not for me. Yeah, yeah. I'm allowed to just like tweak them a little yeah, bit. Yeah, I mean, hey, yeah. I'm just having the guys and we're going to come over and do a songwriting thing in that one room. It's not going to be a big deal, I promise. It's not a big deal. Yeah. I don't, I don't need to reserve the room. No. Like this is my church. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. so that kind of stuff, which was just like, oh, that's new. Yeah. It felt different and something that I had never had to navigate before. Yeah, so you're just turning things on in your brain yes. that were just understanding like, okay, this is honoring to this person because it's their job to make sure that this happens. And so right. by me just walking in, I'm making their job harder. Right. So. And there could be a baby shower. Like there's just stuff Anything. going on. There's things happening. Middle schoolers. They're everywhere. They're everywhere. What is happening? Yeah, yes. no, I get that. That's that's different. Yeah, mm. and it was different. And so for, and maybe part of it was because I was just the one that knew everything at my old church because there was no one to tell. Like I just yeah, it came to you. It came to me, and I had I was the one that did it also. So yeah. I think that was the base thing. It's just like there's just more to navigate, um, dude. Something I never did at my old church was like a service run through. Like we would rehearse the songs and talk through it. But like, we didn't do a run through. Now it's like a full, like I remember even when I was, when I was guest leading at Vineyard, I would, it was like 8.15, the clock will hit zero and you do the service like, you know, like it's going to. And I was like, why are we doing this? And now I'm like, oh, this is amazing. This is really great. But you just, stuff that you just don't know. Yeah. Building a particular kind of muscle memory. A hundred percent. Yeah. Dude. Tyler, thank you for sharing your story. Absolutely. Okay. Can we take one left turn before we turn the button off over yeah, here? Yeah, Absolutely. Tell everybody about your pop music. Yeah, if you've made it this far. Yeah, yeah. If you, no, we, we, want, we want people to know. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, tell, tell everybody, because you're a songwriter. I mean, you're a worship leader, yeah. and you write songs for your church. Yeah. We can talk about that maybe some other time, but, but I know you also have these other songs that are just... Yeah. It's just stuff you do, and it's on Spotify. Well, just tell everybody. Whatever you... I don't know. What do you want to say? Yeah. Well, I think... The, a little bit of context with it was, and like we said, I love songwriting is just a big part of what I love and something over the last two years, three years, I'd even say, I've just tried to like do more of and yeah. get my reps and that kind of, that sort of thing. And so 
I started like my musical journey, like back when we said, you know, learning Jonas Brothers songs, I more, more so have always just been drawn toward this, like the pop world. And I guess you could call it like quote unquote secular music, just mm-hmm. stuff that's not necessarily for a church gathering. Yeah. And so I love pop music. And so I started writing songs back in like 2018 and just trying to like produce music, release it. Just on your laptop. You're just and I had cruising along. Me and I had people like uh that I would collaborate with and, and work with on, you know, trying to create music together yes. and, and releasing it under my name, Tyler yeah. Jarvis. And so yeah, it's just become something that I've just fallen in love with and something that I just really love to do and would love to try to like continue to try to build whatever you want to call it, a career or yeah, I just love you're I love just, watching you're exploring the space. A hundred percent. I love watching like you know a catalog of songs just slowly yeah. get a little bit bigger year after year, and stuff that you know felt like me three four years ago. I probably wouldn't make that now, but it's just this thing in me that I loved at the time, and it's just kind of evolved over over the past couple of years. Yeah, when you said that. Um... I got this thing in my, uh, this thought in my brain. Yeah. Uh, They're artifacts. Yeah, they totally are. You know, and they will, they'll remain. Mm -hmm. You know, that's one of the cool things about books or songs or, and I'm talking about like recorded songs. Yes. They just, they persist into the world, you know, and the little snapshots of time and this is who Tyler was. Then we could see hopefully who is Tyler now and then in the future we'll see who Tyler is. And 100%. It's like a little musical journal it is it's totally musical journal and that's yeah so it's been fun um so i released a bunch of music last year 2023 yeah you're gonna gonna do some more this year yeah so i have six six i hopefully six more songs this year next uh first song of 2024 comes out february 29th hey shameless plug no it's good um and so yeah the goal is just to like release as much music that i'm excited about as, yeah. I, as I can. Um, and so I have a guy, myself, and then a guy that I work with, um, his name's Tyler Redman. He's out in LA. And the two of us collaborate on songs and and it's been, a he, we did everything together last year as well. And so it's been really fun, like partnership to work together. Two Tylers. Two Tylers. That's it, man. That's I it. I love it. Well, I, I love that you do that because Sometimes worship leaders just get stuck in one space and and they don't have to. Yeah. You know? It it doesn't make you less of a worship pastor. For sure. For you to do these other things. Yeah. Yeah, they they can coexist. And so I I I think your story gives people permission to Yeah. I hope so because it's been like I think I I don't know, as I look back, I think I'm a better like thinker i'm a better musician and i'm a better i mean maybe even leader because i'm embracing some of these other things and like hundred trying to explore stuff that like some of this stuff it's just you know it might be unfamiliar yeah and new and especially the thinking portion i mean you probably understand that like as a songwriter as well like the more you just think about words and ideas and and like create something Mm -hmm. it just it's a the process is similar every time. Yeah. It's just the more you do it, the more confident you get in trying to do it. Yeah. No, it, it, it activates parts of your brain and even that musical expression part of you, who you are. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it's impossible to become a better songwriter and then be a worse worship leader. Right. Or, yeah. And it's weird, um, especially studio. Like if you just want to be a better musician, just start recording yourself. If, even if you never release it, because my God, the it's a monitor, different game. Well, and the monitors, they don't care about your feelings. They don't lie. They don't lie, <laughs> no. and then you're like, "Really? Is that me? Do I? Am I pitchy?" Do I, I used to say I used to be like, oh, "I'm more of a live guy." That just yeah. meant I had bad timing. Like, yeah, that's it. That's, <laughs> that's, that's exactly yeah. what it means. And then yeah. you turn the click on, you're like, "Crap!" Like I don't know. I'm not then, as good as I thought. But then if you persist in it. You get comfortable, and all of a sudden the click is not a beast. It's just kind of a reference, and yeah. it's actually then you're like, it's helpful. It's helpful, and then all of a sudden you go to lead worship on a Sunday morning. You're like, you're just better. 
100%. Like, you're, like your range gets extended or yes. something, you yep. know? Yeah. Yeah. Love that. Well, yeah. I didn't want to, I didn't want to press, press stop on this until we had had a chance to at least touch on no, that. No, that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. It's, that's cool. Shout out to all the it. vineyard worship leaders who are making other things. Let's collab. Oh, <laughs> dude, let me tell you, yeah. they're out there. Oh, I know. I'm sure. They're out there. Yeah. They're making records all the time. I love it. All right. Well, uh, Tyler, let's do this again. And I, I'm thinking maybe the next time, let's just talk about songs. I love it. Dude. That'd be cool. That would be really fun. All right, y'all. Listen, go check out Tyler's music. I'm going to put a link in the show notes. Go follow him on Instagram. And then we'll all say hello to one another at the National Conference because it's in Cincinnati. It's in Cincinnati. Good old Springdale. Springdale. Hey, and listen, the Reds are going to be good this year. So yeah. if you come up for the you National Conference, you got to go to a Reds game. Heard it too. here first. Yep. All right, everybody. Peace. Hey everyone, Casey Corum here, producer of the podcast. Thanks for listening. As always, if you've been enjoying the podcast, here's a few ways you can help us. First of all, leave us a review on the podcast platform of your choice. This helps more people find us. Also connect with us on social media, Instagram at the Ferment Podcast and Twitter at Fermentcast. All right, everyone. Thanks for listening. See you next week. Peace. Peace.